Hi everybody, it's Mrs. Inman. I'm still reading Full of Beans for you all. And I'm on chapter 10 today, Academy Award. Shirley Temple, I had better watch out because I could act. It was almost nine o'clock when I yawned dramatically. Oh, I think I'll just go to bed now, I told my mother. A bit early for you, isn't it? Just tired, I guess. Good night. I lay in bed listening to her putter around the bedroom. Everything was quiet. Even Buddy was asleep. I went downstairs and slipped out the back door, pretending that I was going to the outhouse in case she woke up. There's no noise from her room, and I knew I was home free. I slipped off my pajamas and put on my pants and a shirt, and I started walking fast. When I reached Francis Street, I heard something behind me. I whirled around, and there was termite. What are you doing following me? I asked in exasperation. The dog just sat on his hunches and wagged his tail, looking at me drooling. Go home, I ordered, pointing down Curry Lane. He cocked his head at me as if confused. Go, I said in a low voice. He finally got up and wallowed back the way he'd come. Johnny Cakes was waiting for me behind the building. Three wagons of horses and drivers lined up. You remember the plan? He asked me. Yes. Pull the alarm on White and Catherine. He put a hand on my shoulder. Good boy. Don't let me down. I walked quickly through the dark, quiet streets. When I reached the fire alarm, I looked around nervously. I heard a noise and ducked behind a ragged bush. A moment later, our resident writer and another fella stumbled by, singing loudly about dames. When the coast was clear, I moved quickly before I lost my nerve. I fumbled the key and staggered up to open up the alarm. And then I triggered it. The ringing bell sang through the quiet night. I took off running. By the time I slipped into my backyard, the sound of the fire engine had joined the chorus. I quickly put on my pajamas, took a deep breath, and slammed the outhouse door as loudly as I could. When I walked to the kitchen, my mother and Kermit was, were looking at the fire alarm card. Beans, beans, fire alarm went off, Kermit declared. I heard that when I was doing my business, I said. Where is it at? White and Catherine, Kermit said. Oh, how about that, I said. I yawned. Well, I'm going back to bed. The ringing sang me to sleep. The next morning, I dropped by two beds, and we played a game of marbles. I slipped the fire key back onto the hook on my way out, and no one was the wiser. Then I went to see Johnny Cakes. His office was completely empty. There was not a coffin in sight. Next time, you'll have to pull more alarms, he said. I was nearly caught. Sorry, I said. Still, you did good, kid. I might just have to put you on my payroll permanently. And he handed me a roll of bills and added, By the way, I gave you a little bit of a bonus. I counted out the money. He had given me five extra dollars. I had never had so much money in my whole life. I felt like Daddy Warbucks, except with hair. This time, when I walked to Gardner's Pharmacy, the ringing bell on the door sounded like a choir of angels singing, Hallelujah. My eyes took in every shelf, all the glaring bottles and big jars of candy. Why, hello, Beans, Mr. Gardner said. Do you need more bumsteads for Kermit? Well, not today, I said with satisfaction. I'm looking for the best ladies' hand cream you got. Ladies' hand cream, you say? For my mother. There was a shelf with a mirror over it filled with cosmetics. Mr. Gardner pulled down a small jar. It had a fancy label on it that said Paquin's Hand Cream. This one's supposed to be very good, he said. He raised a questioning eyebrow, but it cost five dollars. That's fine, I said, and I handed him the money. Well, you're a sweet boy, Mr. Gardner said. My mother's reaction wasn't quite as pleased. Where'd you get the money for this? She demanded suspiciously. I lied just like a grown-up. Just been picking up a whole lot of cans. And you spend on this? And I nodded. Her face softened. Thank you, son. Honestly, I deserve an Academy Award. And since that chapter was only four minutes long, I'm going to read chapter 11, Party Line. And when you think about party lines, you might be thinking there might be a party going on. No, a party line used to be when all the phones like in a neighborhood were connected to really like one phone like how your phones are in your house you might have five phones in your house 
they're all connected together. Well, this was like a neighborhood, so it's really different because you could be listening in on people's phone calls down the street. Let's find out what happens. The front door was the coolest place to be during the heat of the day. The ceiling was painted a watery blue-green that looked just like the sky. Most of the porch ceilings in Key West were painted this color. Conscious called it Haint Blue, and it was supposed to keep Haints away. If I was a ghost, I wouldn't haunt this shabby little house. I'd haunt something nice, like a mansion. But maybe ghosts were just like the living and were down on their luck. Kermit moaned from where he sat on the step. What's wrong with you, I asked him. My throat hurts. Pork chop came running down the block. Beans! Your paws on the horn, he hollered. Stay here, I told Kermit, and I took off running. Mrs. Saldano handed me the phone when I walked in the door. Poppy, I said, where are you? His voice sounded watery and far away. I'm in New Jersey at your aunt's house. The line was choppy. I could hear someone listening. Judging by the giggles, it was probably that dot. She had a phone at her house. Can you tell your mother that nothing's changed? I knew that what that meant. He still did not have a job. Okay, I said. You tell her I love her and give your brothers a hug for me? I will, I promised. Don't forget, you're the man of the house. Well, how could I? After he hung up, I stayed on the line. Someone laughed again. I know it's you, Dot, I shouted. Man of the house, you're not man enough to play me in marbles. Then she hung up. Oh, how I hated that girl. When I told Ma about the phone call of Poppy, her whole body went still. Ma, I said, are you okay? She straightened her shoulders and smiled. I'm okay. Are we going to be okay? Ma said, uh, of course. But the smile didn't quite reach her eyes. Everything's just fine. That's what I realized that sometimes adults lie because it was easier than telling the truth. A few days later, when my mother walked in the door, her smile was genuine. Mrs. Higgs wants me to make a custom dress for her. Isn't that thrilling? That didn't sound very thrilling. She's going to pay me $9. Now it sounded downright exciting. But I'm going to need a sewing machine. I can get one second-handed down on Duvall's for $25, she said, looked at me. But I need your help. My help? I squealed. I felt a wave of panic. Did she know about me working for Johnny Cakes? Even I didn't get paid that much money. Ma put her hand on my shoulders and looked to me right in the eyes. I need you to go ask Nana Philly for the money. I promise to pay her back. I was confused. You want me to ask her? She sighed. If I go, she'll just complain about your father, about how I made my own bed and I should have to go lie in it. It's much better if you go do it. She'd have to be harder than the devil himself to say no to a child. I wanted to tell her the devil was probably scared of Nana Philly. Just think, if this all works out, I can take in less laundry. That'll be easier on my hands, Ma said. I gave in. Okay, I agreed. I'll do it. Well, you're a good boy, she said with a smile. Then she plucked something black off the kitchen counter. It was Nana Philly's girdle. I found this other mattress in Buddy's crib. I don't know how that would have gotten there. She said, shaking her head. It's a mystery, I said. As Kerm and I walked over, I looked at the girdle. I'm going to miss this, I said. It's the only thing that would keep Buddy in his crib. Kermit shook his head and swallowed wincing. He, took, he looked a little bit pale. This ain't going to work. Let me do the talking, I said. When we reached the house, I knocked on the door, and no one answered. Kermit just grinned. Huh? Would you look at that? She's not home. Guess we'll just have to go. Before his foot could hit the bottom step, the door banged open. What do you want? Ma found your girdle, I said, holding it out. She snatched it out of my hand. She started to shut the door, and I wedged my foot inside. Can we come in for a minute? Kermit's real thirsty. She looked suspiciously at Kermit. Hmm. Come on in. What you waiting for? If any place in Key West was haunted... It was Nana Philly's house. Everyone, everything in it was old. There were old paintings and an ancient piano and expensive china cups. Thick old rugs and a heavy velvet curtain. My great-grandfather had been a wrecker. He salvaged boats that crashed in the treacherous keys and claimed the cargo. 
silver, furniture, silk, you name it. I hear that your father still doesn't have a job, she said bluntly. Of course she'd heard it. I'm sure the whole town knew. Conscious liked to gossip. Ma joked that you couldn't keep anything secret because of the conch telegraph. She shook her head. I told your mother not to marry Curry, but does she believe me? I didn't say anything. I knew better. Nobody's going to hire him up north. I've been there. You have? This was news to me. When? When I was just a girl. I didn't like it one little bit. People are different there. They'll never hire your father. Mark my words. Her eyes narrowed and she got straight to the point. So why are you really here? I shook my head. A tiny part of me admired her. She would never get winkied. So, Nana Philly, this lady wants Ma to make her a dress. Ain't that swell? She grunted. The thing is, Ma needs money for a sewing machine. She pursed her lips. Hmm. So, she sent you over here to ask for money. I nodded. How much does she need, she asked. I told her. That's ridiculous, she shouted. Kermit looked like he was going to faint from fear. Nana Philly studied me sharply. What do you think about this idea of hers? Me? Since when did grown-ups ask kids what they thought? Yes, you. Well, she's real good at sewing, I said, and I pointed at the patch in my pants. I taught her how to sew, Nana Philly told me. She sounded wistful. Then in a moment, she seemed a little like a different person, almost nice. Really? I asked her. But she was always terrible at hymns, she snapped. Just like that, the mean old lady was back. Nana Philly didn't give me the money, which wasn't much of a surprise. A hobo could crawl up her steps and fake from hunger, and she wouldn't give him a dime. To make matters worse, she insisted that Kermit swallow a concoction that she whipped up for his throat. Drink it, she ordered him. It smells funny, my brother said, sniffing the cap suspiciously. But he, she just grabbed it, pinched his nose, and poured it down his throat. He coughed, and his ears turned red. Then... He let a wail and ran from the, from the house screeching. I turned to her. Well, what was in that? She looked at me, horse rash, of course. Best thing for a sore throat. My mother shook her head when I told her what had happened. I don't know what I was expecting, she muttered to herself. I guess I'll just have to hand stitch the dress. That night when I lay in bed, Kermit couldn't stop talking about Nana Philly. She tried to kill me, Beans. My own grandmother tried to kill me. Well, you're still alive, so she did a bad job of it, I observed. It's only because I ran away. She would have finished me off for sure. You'd be really sad if I was dead. I'd have the room all to myself, at least, I pointed out. But I was real curious. Well, how's your throat feel? I asked my brother. Kermit yawned and rolled over. Better. I lay in bed wondering if Nana Philly was right about Poppy not getting work. What if the meanest grown-up in Key West was also the only one who was telling the truth. So that's two chapters. Next time, it'll be chapter 12, Dueling with Dot. Oh my goodness. Dueling with Dot. Remember, Dot's the girl who wants to play marbles. So we'll find out about that next time. See you later. This is Shirley Temple. And this is one example of a 1930s phone.